Hello there, Amanda here and welcome to the Intermezzo podcast, presenting diasporic stories from the UK and beyond. From exploring the kink community in London to talking to experimental artists based in Italy, we'll give insight into how people are taking their varied life experiences and making it work for them. Hello and welcome, Amanda here. And today's guest is Ian Eli Sally Cecondo. A classically trained pianist who brings the joys of piano to an array of different audiences, Ian's influences range from Beethoven to Malcolm X. Born and raised in Rome, Italy, of Ugandan parentage, he has carved out a specific lane for himself where he teaches piano, English, Anglophone culture and performs internationally. He has also found the time to study law and lobby the Italian government for the rights of second generation Italians. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello, Ian. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Okay. How is it in Rome today? Well, uh, thank God. I mean, the temperature is not killing us. I mean, it's uh, (laughs) much more cooler (laughs) and I'm fine. (laughs) Fantastic. Okay. So I'll start with my first question. You have done a lot of traveling, but you were born and raised in Rome. Can you talk a bit about your upbringing and how piano playing became such a large part of your life? So, well, um, I was born in Rome, as you mentioned, and uh, from a Ugandan family. And uh, I have three, I mean, we, we are a family of five. I mean, there is me, which I'm the eldest, and then there is my sister, Lona, and then my little brother. Uh, James, who is not now so little because he's 25. So. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing to notice is that we didn't have an environment where there were many foreigners. I mean, for most of my education, I was the, we were the only black family, mm. uh, apart from my cousin, which, were, which was actually living um, uh, far away from us. Um, and that is kind of strange because maybe... Uh, people in other countries might think that Rome is uh, the capital city of Italy and so probably um, it has some diversity, but actually it doesn't. (laughs) Uh, And that actually affected, uh, you know, uh, my upbringing because um, positively and negatively, because on the positive side, I mean, you have an environment where is homogeneous, more or less. So, I mean, where basically people, I mean, they have more or less the same beliefs. Romans are actually uh, kind of open-minded. So, but still you were the, you know, the element, uh, uh, the different one, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, that, that was the, the strange point of, of being an environment where you want uh, to belong to, but at the same time you're outside of it. Uh, and this, I mean, affected my upbringing I mean no, not bad uh, uh, because I'm still here <laughs> <laughs> yes Ian. But, uh, yeah but this still you know uh, made me think made me think uh, I mean the more I was uh, getting older I mean this was surely something that I put some thoughts on and so well the piano part when uh, when it came well it, it came when my parents were watching a, a, a TV program called Bravo Bravissimo, where there were kids showcasing their talents. And so um, in, in this program, there were sometimes uh, kids playing the piano. And my parents thought that maybe it was good to, you know, give us opportunity to, you know, to learn an instrument. And that was a lovely idea because my parents love music and uh, they really do. Actually, my father sang in a choir and and he also boasted about being, uh, when he was younger, (laughs) uh, an actor. (laughs) 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 So, you know, uh, some African fathers are so full of themselves. They are just like, well, you know what? Yeah, yes, I did amazing things and look at you. you Uh, (laughs) Yeah, nothing. I mean, but when I was your age, you know, you can't imagine. I was, you know, good at very uh, reading or uh, reading nice operas, or even some of the African writers that you didn't read. I mean, okay, that. But 
a lot. I mean, so just me, some books, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but it was, you know, good, you know, even having him so so proud of himself. I mean, that was indeed uh, something positive. So, uh, and my mother always is always singing. So um, if I have a picture of my mother, is uh, someone who really sings all the time. Amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, all songs. I mean, I started not with Beethoven, no, no Bach, but with some Ugandan pop music. Nice. And, <laughs> and the ABBA. <laughs> and the ABBAs were so famous. I mean, uh, for me, it's not Christmas without the, the music compilation. <laughs> <laughs> but can you sing something? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, look, there is... Um, uh, uh, and, I can't right now because I actually need the uh, the songs there because it's something that starts immediately because it's something that I learned since I was very little when I didn't know any word of English. But it was really, it is fascinating, yes, this fact of Nana Marumara singing all the time. If it wasn't for the TV program, you wouldn't have started piano. No, I think that they had this idea. They had this idea already. But I think that the TV program uh, have given them an extra push in that direction. And so we started. I, I took up piano and she took up uh, the violin. It was amazing. I mean, uh, the beginning. But then, I mean, uh, the idea of music or the idea of learning an instrument is something even there related more or less to class uh, because uh, it was seen at the time, I'm talking about uh, the, the end of the 90s, uh, where still, I mean, you know, if you are middle class, you, you study music, okay? Uh, and of course, they are, they were the models that I had actually were non existent. I mean, there were no model, you know, to look up to, nothing. I mean, apart from Tom and Jerry. <laughs> 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 I think that more, I mean, that, that cartoon, I mean, initiated a lot of uh, pianists around the world. <laughs> How? Uh, okay, I don't understand. What do you mean? <laughs> Because they, there was an episode where actually Tom was playing the, the Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt, uh, the second one, uh, on the piano, which is ta da ba 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 I mean, very famous one. But yeah, I mean, I think that everyone really started playing the piano, more or less, seeing that cartoon and that specific <laughs> episode. And I will come back to that because, I mean, I started in this fashion and uh, my parents were really supported us, but we didn't really have a direction. Others were still had the idea of the middle class. You know, you're studying something because, I mean, it is cool. It makes you more, more in society, more knowledgeable. I mean, you look better with your friends and maybe even for me, but you know, coming from an immigrant family, you are not really expected to do that. And I also had this, uh, the suspicion that maybe even your teachers were not putting enough effort in teaching you and giving you, or even in pushing you to do, yeah, yeah I mean, to bring out your potentials. Okay, and, and just to clarify, so you're saying you're, you are not middle class? No, no, I would define uh, my family as a working class. My father was the only one working and he didn't have uh, what is called in Italian a contratto tempo indeterminato, which I think it is a sort of long-term contract, permanent contract. Yeah, he, he didn't have any. I mean, he had uh, uh, actually between June and September where he didn't work. And so he had, you know, asked for a loan in a bank in order to, you know, and then when the contract was renewed, I mean, uh, and my mother was not working was not working because part for, of, uh, of the environment, because I mean, the, the Italian uh, labor market does not encourage women, especially mothers to work. 
I mean, it is not really, it is not really encouraged. But one thing that actually pushed her to stay at home and was, of course, uh, all of us. My grandmother uh, actually died when my died when my mother was very young. So she keeps saying all the time that she did so, uh, growing us up was something that she did also for her mother that wasn't able to see her. So yeah, this is something that she says all the time. So, uh, and, and something that she considered her achievement. My mother is proud of that and I'm proud too because uh, my mother was my first English teacher. <laughs> All the time I joke with my mother saying, I don't know if I will, uh, will be, I will be lucky as you are to have children like us or like me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> modesty, what modesty. Uh, she was the one following us. And I think uh, um, when it was summer, they were uh, at our home, there was always a time where we were supposed to study all together. And these things are so precious. I mean, so... Uh, that was part of my upbringing. Lovely. Wonderful. Okay, so next question. The classical music you play is influenced by a range of pianists from different cultures. Can you speak to some of your influences and what draws you to these performers? Considering uh, my education, which was too Western, uh, too Western in my, from my point of view, because when I started to realise that there were other traditions are the way of thinking or com completely different thoughts even to see myself that was also a huge turning point because I realized that I was not actually who I thought I was especially in the eyes of others that was something that really changed completely my perspective and so I decided especially music to have an approach that it was um, as much wider as possible. For example, I love uh, Chinese music. Chinese classical music. Absolutely. I mean, they have transcribed uh, the, their own traditional music uh, in Western instruments or using also their own uh, instrument coming from their tradition. And I think that actually that is something that most African countries should do uh, and must do. Um, because um, not everything must be westernized or, or at least you know you can use western instruments to allow a certain degree of exploration but uh, just focus on it or just thinking that Mozart or Beethoven are just the uh, pinnacle of you know any sort of musical achievement uh, nah <laughs> it is something that I don't buy <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then uh, one thing that surprised me is uh, discovering that in the past there were extraordinary musicians that were black, that were with African origins. For example, I mentioned the Afro-American pianist uh, uh, Hazel Scott, a wonderful woman, an extraordinary musician uh, with a very dazzling career. She actually shocked me very much seeing her a talented uh, young woman enjoying playing the piano, you know, not like some of those old blogs that you see playing the piano, uh, you know, uh, getting on the stage with that uh, look where they are saying basically, now I, um, I show you how this piece should be played. Uh, I think actually it was very bad for European and American society, or at least white America, uh, to have these, uh, let's say, uh, a sanitized uh, approach to the uh, to to the legacy of of the past. But then there is also Art Tatum, uh, another great musician, and all of them were really knowledgeable also about uh, European uh, classical music. I mean, uh, they 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 knew that stuff, but they also created something completely new, more close to their taste. And then one thing that actually uh, Anna, shocked me is a piano that as i mentioned to you before was uh it was initiated in you know in piano playing uh after watching uh, tom and jerry <laughs> <laughs> uh, this guy is a chinese pianist he's called, his name is lang lang 
uh, a very famous pianist. But he performed at the beginning of the 2000s in Carnegie Hall, basically performing with, you know, the, the dress, the, the formal one, the Western, uh, for uh, the uh, frack, I don't know how is it called. But then he changed in the middle of the concert. I use a traditional Chinese one. And he performed a terrific, I mean, his performance was really amazing. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. That made me a huge impression. Uh, also because he was, uh, he was not dressing in the formal way that you would expect from a classical musician. He was dressing following his tradition. And that actually gave me the idea or the desire to, to follow more my, my heritage. So uh, now I can tell you that in all concerts that I, um, uh, where I perform, uh, I don't use any formal dress, nothing. I just use um, dresses coming from South Africa, uh, from a, um, a beautiful uh, tailors. Uh, I mean, I bought, uh, I bought so many in the last 10 years, so many of those dresses. And I'm very happy of that uh, because not only I feel uh, free to express myself, and that also gives, you know, uh, it enriches your persona as an artist, but it also makes you unique, more or less. And this was actually a huge for me because for a long time I suppressed this this feeling or even you know something little as wearing a dress uh, colorful like that I thought that maybe people would look at me like I mean what he why is he doing that why is not also because in Italy there's a lot of conformity and things are seen as traditional it's not traditional it's not something that was, you know, discarded in the dustbin of the of the past. It is something present mm -hmm. because I am here, you know. Also, with my skin is perfect. <laughs> it makes you look good. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I cannot even imagine myself playing the piano dressed differently. see, I mean, uh, it was not an African that helped me, uh, but it was a Chinese person. But, uh, but I think that the Chinese artists have done a lot to, you know, to push this idea that you don't have to conform to Western traditional attire or suppress yourself. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely, yes. Go on. At what age was that turning point? where you decided, you know what, I'm going to start wearing traditional African attire? I mean, it was a long process. It was uh, at 20, but then uh, I started thinking and questioning things at around 16, 17. Mm -hmm. And how old are you now, just for context? I am 32. And, um, and yes, I mean, uh, at the time, um, because I didn't have information and, you know, today, things are completely different from when I was a teenager because YouTube was still, you know, beginning. There were not so many videos. There were not so many information available, especially the information that I needed. Um, but thank God I had at least, uh, let's say, encountered Malcolm X. That guy really changed my life. Uh, um, the first place that I visited when I uh reached uh, the united states uh, i mean the state of new york uh well new york city it was the place where I, uh, he was assassinated because i owed that man so much uh, he set such an example for me that i really hope that to die even being one eighth of the man he was what why did he impact you so strongly uh, it, it is rather stupid to think and maybe because we are pushed we are um, especially in the past, now we are, uh, we are far more aware. Uh, the idea that we have 
to suppress our feelings and not to expose this white fragility. Uh, it is something that was so ingrained. And, uh, you know, when I was little, I used to walk away whenever I saw any person that was a foreigner who was not looking white. And just, I didn't want others to associate my, uh, myself with those people. That's very honest of you to say, because I don't think you're alone in that. I think a lot of children do that when they start to understand the social dynamics a little bit. Yes, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I, I'm honest and I'm, but also to, to set an example, because I had those thoughts and I am ashamed of that, but I also know that I was pushed. It was not my doing. First of all, there is a, a very human need, which is you don't want to look different from a group that you think you belong to. There is, uh, there is this, and that is human, okay? But also there is the responsibility on the other side also to recognize when uh, you are not comfortable. How do you think Malcolm X has framed the way you think culturally? I mean, he was such an important figure for me because, I mean, he allowed me to uh, think freely to think free without uh, being fearful about the fragility of others. Because sometimes, I mean, what you might say uh, might be offensive to others, but this doesn't mean that you have to stop, you know, thinking, especially if what you think, it is something that can bring you any sort of advantage. And maybe it is not even a, a selfish approach, you know, where, um, by selfish, I mean, where you are not taking something away from others, but you are genuinely think something for yourself, for your improvement. But apart from that, I mean, uh, Malcolm X uh, was really an example. Uh, I don't know, because many people still today uh, think the, the thing uh, he said, but there is not that courage because of, of course, we are living in, in a white society. There are still some things that affect us. Uh, thank God it's not anymore like maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But still, I think it is, um, uh, he is important just to allow us to have a sort of independent thinking. Mm -hmm. Also to imagine ourselves not anymore as black people, because even that is something very important. Um, because if there is this dico dichotomy like white and black, I mean, uh, we're still humans. I mean, uh, it, it can be, you know, naive to say that. Well, it, it is just like when I was in the classroom, uh, when I was in primary school and everyone was looking at me and saying, yeah, yes, but we are all equal. <laughs> and I was the only <laughs> black guy in the, in the class. <laughs> you know, <laughs> for them, it's much easier to say that. Okay, from my perspective, it was not, but still, we all love, we all suffer, we, we all bleed in the same way, and we all have dreams. And I think um, that um, being so uh, adamant in, you know, in, 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 in facing white supremacy mm -hmm. and seeing things from our own perspective also gives you the idea that you have a platform and you have, let's say, a scope of action. I mean, that you actually have um, um, a sort of way to influence your reality, that you don't have always to be passive and not even passive in your thinking. Uh, so that is honestly the, I mean, the lessons that I've learned that I'm still learning from uh, that guy, which I think really, um, I, I'm not even surprised that he's demonized. Why are you not surprised? Because, of course, he was saying things that are against white fragility. And he also said something that goes all the time overlooked, but it is crucial when you talk about the civil rights movement uh, in the United States. Um, first of all, America, the, the government has never signed the Declaration of Human Rights. It is something that they recognize as, I mean, and this just to consider some aspects of the legislation, mm. even. Um, uh, race relations as a domestic affair. 
you know, in fact, was kind of hypocritical to criticize South Africa when they were practicing <laughs> segregation for 500 years. <laughs> I mean, it is, it, 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 it is just, it, it is just so stupid. But this is just make, I mean, of course, in their perspective, saying all these thing, uh, the things might be not offensive, but of course, it makes them uncomfortable because it goes against any sort of universality that, you know, they feed on the entire world or all the arrogant position on different matters. And one thing that is very important to realize about the civil rights movement is that it basically says um, that the life of an, a people with a dark skin color or with African descent, his fundamental rights are negotiable up mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, a democratic conversation. I mean, mm. they have granted rights, you know. I mean, it is just like, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and it is very insulting. It is very mm. insulting. And, and consider also that uh, the fact that many people like Marco Mix, uh, I mean, figure like him, European history books are full of, I mean, there is a plenty of people like him, <laughs> really. I mean, but, but I never thought that actually it is sad that actually there were also pe black people think talking about these things. I mean, people were not passive, but they have given us the idea that the rest of the world is passive. Yeah. Or also the idea that uh, just white people think. But then I think it must have been quite a shock for you at 16. Pretty much your environment was entirely white, right? So it was just yes. you and your family. Yeah. So then to see that in a book must have been quite shocking, but also it was in English. But did that separate you somehow from it? No, because I actually I think that uh, uh, I think that the Anglo-Saxon world is very different from the Italian one because Italy has been very much connected with the cultures of the Mediterranean. Mm. Now we are not anymore because we are a U.S. colony. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> Listen, be careful what you're saying. Eh? <laughs> geopolitically speaking, we are. I mean, <laughs> geopolitically speaking, we are. We are a U.S. colony. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't really care, and uh, uh, the Italian population is so old uh, but still uh, this the history it is full uh, it is rich of uh, important human values the latin literature has so many beautiful examples that actually the best thing for the italian is just to align the um, politically culturally it's very difficult with what the Anglo-Saxon world has done around the world. Uh, because the Italian, they consider themselves kind of white, but they are not. Um, but not really, because they don't really even believe sincerely. I mean, as much as the Germans or the British or the uh, white America are thought of themselves. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Italy has been always has always been invaded by Northern Europeans or by the Spanish or even by the Turks. By I mean, uh, has always been colonized. And that, uh, this actually affected the character of the people. Imperialism, I think it was, it is something that they in, uh, supported because of course they went to Ethiopia, they went to Eritrea, uh, they created an empire. I mean, Mussolini was very happy about that, but it was short-lived and it was very cruel but it, it didn't last for four, 400, 500 years. This is what I'm saying. Mm. I mean, this is not to justify them, but also to say that also the history and, I, and Italy, it is 3,000, 4,000 years old. Uh, I mean, uh, there were many different cultures, many different powers and very strong connections with, I mean, we, were, we are at the center of the, uh, of the Mediterranean. For us, uh, the, there is no Middle East. There was the Near East, Il Vicino Oriente. That was the Republic of Venice used to call, you know, what we call the Middle East. But even that is a change of perspective. But without Malcolm, I, I would not have been able to, to seek knowledge that do not conform to the prejudices of my environment and to challenge myself and being uncomfortable as well because it is much easier to conform to your surrounding and you know and just go with the flow 
there is a strong core which is actually coming from my parents which did not indoctrinated me with uh, some uh, ugandan values but they are very proud ugandans but above all they consider more praiseworthy being a good a good person hard working mm -hmm. someone who studies yeah, actually in uganda is uh, especially in, uh, in the uh, well in both in the busoga the ethnicity group of my mother and the buganda kingdom uh, where uh, my father belongs to taking time to study think and make a contribution to the society that has always been something valued there is also a term that i don't really know exactly but it's something that i recognize all the time it, it is something like thank you for studying mm. that they say in luganda uh, which is the language that are spoken by a good part of the ugandans uh, and this has always shocked me, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, but they say all the time, even the elders, actually that destroyed also, uh, you know, the, the idea uh, that I absorbed, like the uh, just Europeans value uh, critical thinking. It's not true. It is something that they keep saying all the time because their achievements are really good. But that is the reason why I'm, I'm saying that it is important to transcend, to, translate, to transcend the limits of the past to the ideologies mm. that we have been indoctrinated with, trying to bring the best and cooperate. And I'm uh, absolutely for supporting African business sci scientists, experts, whatever, really. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, I'll go to the next question. You quoted an Italian conductor, Riccardo Mutti, who said music is a need of the spirit. Why do you resonate with that statement and what benefits do you think music has given you? Uh, the benefits I have, um, I mean, were very evident during lockdown. <laughs> because when you are confined between the walls of your home, it is... I think it is good and refreshing to have something challenging you like, a good piece of music, but also something that allows you to travel in space and time because you can see, you can visit places when you study music and you can travel in time because you can, you know, perform, uh, play pieces that are two, three hundred years old or even two, three, four years old, you know. So it enriches you on so many levels. And uh, music, uh, not, not Western music, uh, at least not necessarily. I still say that it is not the gold standard. I think it is something that they have done very well, but uh, the West collectively, but still the individuals, I mean, they have gone through so, so massive hardships sometimes. and. It is impossible not to connect with them, as it would be even foolish to think that you would not be able to connect with other people, for example, in China, in Indonesia, or in Ghana, or in Uganda, or in the United States, or in Brazil, where there is an amazing pianist uh, I like him very much, Hercules Gomez. Uh, I mean, for those listening to us, I mean, go and check it out. <laughs> that, uh, that, he's an amazing guy. But still, Music is important. Music involves understanding rhythm, and it is something that you understand when you see season changing, when you see the living world uh, being born, growing, dying. I mean, it is some, something uh, that I think that belongs to, not just to humans, actually, I think, because even uh, the living world is full of music. <laughs> it's full of music. I mean, we make our own music, but, uh, and then it's also, it helps you relieve, it helps you understand, it helps you focus. It, it is a need of the spirit, really. When something bad happens, it soothes you. It makes you company. I mean, these things are all so important for our lives. So, uh, it's not all the time are very happy. <laughs> so, um, I consider in this sense, uh, music a gift mm. probably I mean I'm not coming from a very rich family and having had the opportunity to 
you know, to to learn the instrument, to work on it, and and to you know to have the possibility to hone my my ability. It is something that I'm very glad to give back. I love performing for audiences of all kind, really. In fact, uh, I performed this um, in the end of June, but I was happy that the audience was, I don't want to put everything on, uh, base everything on race, but, uh, but having people black, white, and then whatever, you know, uh, listening to me, I, I, and the grand piano was put actually out in the open. And that was, for me, beautiful, because this is exactly what I wanted. I mean, and everyone was actually having an aperitif, and then they were listening to me. I, I mean, uh, it, it, it is good. It is good. I mean, yeah, music has to participate in the lives of, of the people. It is not something that has to be confined in the, you know, in the halls where rich people or some sort of middle class, you know, just, you know, pay some sort, a huge amount of money, then they get inside. Uh, and some of them also with the scores, you know, just to follow if the, if the pianist or the performer is doing everything correctly. I mean, that is so, I mean, <laughs> it's so insane. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Where was it? Where was this performance? Oh, in uh, Prato, in Prato, in Tuscany. Um, I actually be performing in uh, also next month in uh, uh, in Milan uh, in a, in an event called the Blackness Fest. <laughs> yeah, and I actually uh, there is there is a piece that I'm uh, that I'm studying uh, of um, Samuel Col Coleridge Taylor, who was um, a British guy with uh, but of Sierra Leone's uh, origins from the side of his uh, father, because her mother was English, and um, uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and actually he put on, uh, on the score the songs that he was uh, listening, uh, the Afro-American singing, you know, uh, the spirituals. You know. But that made me also very sad especially the piece that I'm uh, studying is called uh, I'm Troubled in Mind. You know? Very beautiful, very, very. I'm troubled, I am troubled, I am troubled in mind. If Jesus don't help me, I surely will die. I mean, it is just like... Deeply sad. It, it, it is sad and it is such a beautiful piece, very well done. And it, it is sad that these things are not even taught in, in conservatory. Uh, we should really, uh, you know, I mean, there are some others, I mean, uh, some enlightened teachers, surely outside of Italy, that uh, give, um, yeah, because here, unfortunately, they are very conservative. They are not very open. They, are, they just stick with their canon. But one thing that uh, actually made me think is that um, he was not just um, complaining whoever you know was singing this or put uh, put this into words um, about the toil and hardship that they were experiencing but also the consequences of it or, or even of the, the white supremacies uh, so supremacy of the time you know being trouble in their mind we are always talking about you know mental health but just imagine these people that they were singing in order to alleviate. They, uh, I mean, this made me very emotional also because I can understand very well the plight, uh, which is, I mean, I'm very far from that because, of course, we are di we, we are living in different periods. But still, I think it is worthy uh, that we promote also this, the creativity the ingenuity 
of people of the diaspora, what they have done in the past, but also trying, as I said before, trying to transcend um, all this uh, and having some hope, having some hope for the future, being hopeful, being positive, or even telling people or, try, or be engaged in a conversation where we don't reach on a definition of universality, uh, but where we contribute to it and even confront people that, of course, I mean, are, are against it. Uh, so, yes, it is important to confront white supremacies, but it's also true to bear in mind that uh, what defines us is not what we are because of what we suffered, or what has been afflicted upon us. Um, I think it, this is very important to bear in mind. We are not this and we have to be hopeful that there is a future, a better one, that there is something awaiting us and that hopefully a generation of black, white, uh, or yellow, green, purple, or whatever people, then they will come the machine or AI, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, uh, probably the advent of AI will make all these, uh, uh, all these obsolete. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, totally meaningless. But I don't know. Uh, but I still hope that. Uh, but but we must have a chance to change things. Yeah, you have a lot of hope and belief. I think I can feel that through um, how you speak. We must have because I I. I think that the, we are too much focused on the confrontational approach that, are, that there is there in America for good reasons, but I don't really think that that can be defined as the yardstick of the black experience worldwide. Uh, it, it is indeed something that, that the West, you know, made very symbolical. I mean, uh, between the relation uh, between the relation between white Europeans and Africa at, at large. Mm. But the same could be said around the world. But we have to get rid of all this and focus on things that can actually improve our lives. Uh, but yes, I, I, I am for a sort of reconciliation because as I told you, I'm still Italian. I was born here in this country. It's a country that I love. It's a country that I criticize. I'm still also a, a, a proud African. Uh, I am also very critical about the legacy of Western imperialism and colonialism. And I don't buy also all the West pro Western pro propaganda. I don't. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> not, not anymore. And I, I hope a lot of people do that. But even for the sake of people in Europe and America as well, I mean, it is something that we have to move on. Because otherwise, I think, I don't know, what would three? Uh, uh, and this will be really, uh, maybe pr probably the very first world war, because the other one were just like uh, ethnic conflict among European powers. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, that involved all of us, let's be honest. Yes, the, we were involved, but the interest that were on the table were completely Europeans. It was a power struggle uh, that actually was born in Europe, actually in Eastern Europe, like more or less they are doing today. <laughs> uh, but, but still, um, you know, to think that really it was a, a battle uh, between people that decided to go against each other. No, it was um, a handful of nations that um, in order to maintain their grip around the world, they moved all, you know, all pawns in one direction or the other, just for their own interests. And then they decided to throw uh, an, ato an atom bomb. <laughs> well, to, <laughs> just casually, uh, one Tuesday. Uh, just casually, and then they were saying, well, but, you know, that was the only solution to end the war. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, my way of reasoning is that um, to see it, not from the European lenses, but from let's say a different point of view like many people actually saw uh, the conflict in other side of the world i read some accounts from some senegalese uh, soldiers 
uh, that were fighting. I mean, but they were promised that, yeah, yeah, you, you have a French citizenship. And then they were in the battleground, uh, the like, okay, but we are fighting uh, a white war. <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, we are fighting for the white. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, but it's, it's negotiation, right? It's not like they had much of a choice. The bargaining chip was, listen, we'll give you this, your freedom or whatever. And then they recede it. And that's always what happens. And I think this is why I understand your humanist perspective but there's definitely a part of me that just thinks that there needs to be a part that is protected at all costs. Okay, so you mentioned mental health before. Um, how do you keep yourself motivated and what aspirations do you have for your musical career? So I keep myself motivated, uh, planning ahead my uh, the things that I want to do in my life. And this probably might sound rather obvious, but uh, I, but I think it is important to get excited with what you uh, uh, with what you do or what you are planning to do. And um, some might also think that maybe playing the piano is something that uh, you know that for which it is maybe easier you know to look at the uh, future with more positivity, but uh, it is hard work. Because of course, uh, uh, playing, uh, performing, studying, uh, and also there is a lot of other uh, things to do, like getting in touch with people, uh, negotiate uh, 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 your 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 salary, your, uh, and then also you know take care of if there is a good instrument or not. Um, but still, I think uh, that is important to have a positive attitude uh, towards life, uh, be uh, knowing that we still have the possibility, uh, no matter our circumstances, to change our future. And this is not like you know the uh the were i mean i'm not speaking like those american gurus thinking yeah yes you can do it <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we the land of opportunity no i mean i, I found it hard but still i think that uh, uh if i am here is to be happy and to make uh, other people the people that i love happy even the people that i love and i don't know yet so um, for example, the people listening to me. So, uh, or the people reading or uh, the things that I write or maybe the people talking to me or the people that I listen to. I think that uh, being open and being, um, uh, I mean, this keeps me motivated. This keeps me motivated. This keeps me, uh, I am, I don't know, I am in love with life. Uh, life, life has been good with me. Uh, I am uh, I am blessed, grateful for many things in my life. Um, and, I, and I also want to make uh, uh, people, especially not just because I focus just on black people, because I'm not that racist, <laughs> but, <laughs> but still, I know uh, the things that we have been through. Oh, um, and I think that we also need, also for the people that came before us, there must be something good. I mean, uh, the sufferings, the plight, I mean, must be, um, must be met with um, uh, that from our generation uh, onwards, um, something for which, I mean, we are happy. It is bad to always see uh, people, black people brutalize, always claiming for rights with all sorts of problems. I mean, we also have to be a sort of people full of hope, bringing good news, uh, the hardworking ones, not because we just work uh, the work for the sake of work, but because we really believe in um, bringing something better with what we do with our hands and with our brains. So, um, and that I think is uh, the maximum ideal also of my, of my family. I also think that, 
I think uh, uh, that is may maybe a very personal thing, but uh, uh, but I think that I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. Um, my parents are good people. Before them, there were other good people, uh, people that stress all the things that I, that I know that I'm doing, and that actually is something that make me at peace. Uh, I mean, uh, and I just hope that um, uh, to do better and bring uh, as much good as possible. Amazing. Oh, Ian. Oh, bless you. Um, well, thank you for speaking to me. That was great. My pleasure, really. Thank you for having me. And that was Ian, Eli Sali Ciaconde. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, he's pretty awesome. Uh, you can find all his information in the show notes. Just in case you don't get there, you can find him on www.iansully.com. And again, keep writing to us at intermezzo podcast at arcrepublic.com. Good speaking with you. Hopefully speak to you soon and take it easy. Mm-hmm.